speech brings order out of chaos, that's what I said, but it appears that speech brings chaos out of order as well, and the answer to that is it does. Uh, there was only so many complications I could address in the talk simultaneously. Um, if, you look at, if you look at the most archaic of archetypal heroes, th those heroes confront something that represents chaos. It's usually a monster that bears a treasure of some sort, and that's a symbolic representation of the class of all unexplored things, right? Because things that we have not yet explored are threatening and destructive, but also offer us infinite potential. But more elaborated hero stories, let's say, also reverse that and say that, well, there are times when the order has become so corrupt and rigid that free speech fragments it into its parts so that it can rejuvenate itself. And so, I mean, in, actually in the Gospels, that's the hero that Christ is basically represented as. He's not so much the dragon confronting the dragon slayer who gathers the treasure, although that's implicit in the, in the juxtaposition of Christ with the figure of like a serpentile Satan. But Christ is the thing that stands up against the corrupt state and rejuvenates it through speech. And so, technically speaking, free speech, the Logos, is the thing that mediates between chaos and order. And you can think about, this is represented in, 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 in many cultures, this idea. You can see it most specifically, I would say, in the Taoist conceptualization. Because in the Taoist world, being is made out of chaos and order. Yin and yang, masculine and feminine. Fundamentally, it's chaos and order. And order is the fact that wherever you go, there are things you understand. And, or, and chaos is the fact that wherever you go, there are things you don't understand. And so the idea is that being is made out of the things that you understand and the things that you don't understand. And it's always that way, which is why Tao is the symbol of being per se. And it's the case. Your brain is adapted, in fact. It's partly why it has two hemispheres. For the world that you understand and the world you don't understand. The world you understand, roughly speaking, being handled by the left. And the world you don't understand, roughly speaking, being handled by the right. Well, it's that line down the middle that's Tao. That's meaning. And if you have one foot in chaos and one foot in order, you're maximizing information flow and rejuvenating yourself at the same time that you're maintaining your structure. And you will report on that internally as engagement in the world. It's the most fundamental orienting sense that you have. And it's deeply instantiated neurologically, unbelievably deeply. And so it really is the case, from an evolutionary perspective, that reality is chaos and order. It's that to which you're adapted. And so sometimes you're speaking on behalf of chaos, and sometimes you're speaking on behalf of order. It's more complicated than that too, though, because when we have a dialogue, say, and, and we're, we're mutually attempting to climb towards the truth instead of convincing each other that we're right, say, then what we're doing is engaging in the simultaneous fragmentation of old and archaic belief systems, and they're updating. And you can experience that because someone will say something that, that sets you back, and then you'll get what they're saying and it'll click together and what you're experiencing is the death of, a, of, a, of an old conceptualization structure it's disintegration and then it's reconfiguration in a tighter, in a tighter order and people love that, they live for that it's, it's, it, it's, it really, it's what keeps you alive and you can experience that in a deep conversation, a, a truthful conversation a meeting of the minds and soul and people love that, it's curative all psychotherapists know this because what you do in psychotherapy, as well, uh, in addition to helping people face the things that they're most afraid of so that they can overcome them, is to allow them to tell someone the truth. What happened to you? I'll listen. So they tell you, and they take themselves apart and put themselves together while they're speaking the truth about what happened. And it puts them together. It's at the, you know, the, the two fundamental elements of psychotherapy are Let's find what you're afraid of and avoiding and help you confront it so that you can gather the information that's there. And let's allow you to lay your story out in all of its catastrophe and detail so that you can straighten yourself out through speech. That's exactly what happens in psychotherapy. So and it should happen in every real relationship. It's, it's the spiritual purpose of a marriage fundamentally, right? Because you face someone who's different than you that you're tied to and cannot run from. And so you can reveal yourself, really, really, it's a, critical, it's a critical part of marriage. Because if you can run from someone, they will never show you their true face. Because if someone shows you their true face, you will run. 
And so you say in a marriage ceremony, I will allow you to show me your true face and I will not run. And unless you mean that, you'll never be married. You'll never understand what it means. And you'll never reap the benefits of it, which are practical, obviously, but also spiritual and psychological. There's a reason for the vow, but it has to be a vow. Because otherwise you have a back door open and you'll never really tell the person what you're like. And no bloody wonder, because really, who wants to know what you're like? So, the question is, the first was a comment about the emphasis in my talk today on altruism, and the second is, how do, I, how do people overcome their proclivity to only act on their own behalf? Okay, so the first thing I will say is that I don't believe that what I spoke about today was in favor of altruism. And, and I, that's not a negative comment on your question. But, there, so there's a, there's, there's a, here's a primary religious injunction. Treat the other person like you would like to be treated yourself. That does not mean be nice to other people. It does not mean sacrifice yourself excessively for other people. It means think about the other person as if they were you and figure out how you can mutually interact to better both of you at the same time. You have to build yourself into the equation. It's an equation. It's not that, I, it's not that others are more valuable. It's that we're all valuable, we're equally valuable, and then you think, well, how do you remind yourself of that? And the answer to that is through terror. Because terror is the genuine motivator. So they say, fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means first that you don't get away with anything. And it's really useful to know that, because if you really know that, you won't try to get away with, well, you still will, because people are stupid, but, <laughs> but at least it will mitigate the possibility. So, here I'll tell you something that Jung said, this is quite, this is quite profound, and, and it's, I think, the right answer to this question. So Jung believed, he was interested in the emergence of higher morality, uh, something that the developmental psychologist Jean Piaget was also interested in. Piaget thought, we started out as individuals, and then we learned to play games with other people, kids, children, learned how to play games with other children, and that made them social. So our society is a game, it's a giant game that we're all playing together voluntarily. And so children first learned how to play the game, and only later did they learn the rules of the game. They learned how to play the game first, and then learned the rules, how to speak the rules. And then at some point they realized that they were also creators of the rules. And so that's moral development on a continual, on, on a, it's not a continuum, it's, it's, it's a fractured staircase upward. But Jung was interested in elements of moral action that were higher than that, and so he conceptualized it symbolically. So imagine this, he did this in the last book he wrote called Mysterium Conjunctionis. So imagine that you, you exist so that your conceptual structures and your emotions are in uneasy relationship with one another. So you're sort of a house divided amongst yourself. And so what you have to do is you have to put together your mind and your, and your emotions so that they're working as a, as a unit. And you do that in part by actually being forthright about what it is that you want for yourself and, and to other people and to learn how to negotiate that. So that that inner tension disappears. And so now you're a unified, you're a unified entity of emotion and thought. They're not conflicting with one another. And then what you do is you take that entity which is still in some sense separate from your body because you're not acting these out and you bring those two together. And he thought about that as the psychological equivalent of the incarnation. It's, it's integrated spirit integrating with the body. And what that means is that you take your emotions and motivations and capacity for thinking that are now one thing and you act out those things. You, so you embody them in the world and that's another thing that brings integrity and then there was a step past that and the step past that is to understand that there's no di so you have the integrated spirit mind and body in opposition to the world and this the next thing you do is realize that there is no opposition with the world is that what you are is a and this is very very complicated you're walking down the street, Blur, Blur Street is a good example of this in Toronto, and there are decimated alcoholics, schizophrenics, littering the landscape, so to speak. You walk around them, you say, well, that's not me. It's like, yes it is. It's you insofar as your tendency is to react in a, in a negative way and to skirt the territory. It's, it's a disturbance in your field of being. It's you. 
Now you don't know what to do about it and I wouldn't recommend that you do anything because you'd probably just make it worse. It's a very big problem that's lying there on the sidewalk and it may be well beyond your capacity to fix it. But insofar as it's a disturbance in your field of being, it's you. It's you. And all the problems that are in the world that, that you experience, they're you. And so you stop thinking about things in terms of an opposition between what's good for you and what's good for the world because there's no difference there's no difference between the two and that doesn't mean that the pathway from what's good for you in, in your more limited domain to what's good for everyone is an easy one to compute it's very very difficult but there is no there is no technical difference between them you know so if I'm engaged in a psychotherapeutic dialogue with my clients when I'm doing it properly it's not like they're learning from me it's that we're learning together and every time I solve one of their problems or help them solve one of their problems I help myself solve one of my problems you know because people bring to me bring into my sessions the terrible things that go wrong with people in life their partner has cancer their father's has it father has Alzheimer's they're suffering with alcoholism their career is collapsing like these aren't things that are happening to them these are things that happen to everyone. And to figure out how to solve that for someone is to figure out how to solve it for yourself. There's no difference whatsoever. And so, and then, so there's to know that, to, to think of that, and certainly works in, in, a, in, a, in an intimate relationship. If you think that you're somehow different than your wife, well, certainly she's going to remind you otherwise constantly. But it's an, it's an error. It's an error because you're, you're tied together so tightly that whatever happens to one inevitably happens to the other and that's true in in the networked reality that we all inhabit so then the the terror thing emerges when you start to realize that those problems that you don't address that are maybe magnified by your impulsive and foolishly self-centered and instrumental behavior you're manipulating the world on behalf of your own narrow interests those will come back to haunt you and so, you, it's a terrifying thing to think through. But once you think it through and understand it, then what happens is, you're more afraid of acting selfishly than you are willing to do it. You think, oh, no, I'm not doing that. Why? Because I know all hell will break loose if I do that, and I'm not going there. And so the terror element is a huge one. It makes it, 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 it fortifies your, because you can't just act properly. You don't have the moral fortitude for that. You can aim at the good and run from what's terrible, then you're, then you're motivated. So.